Hey. So uh, before we get started, I guess I get to self-promote a little bit more since uh, Ilya already got an intro. So um, I'm the editor-in-chief at Arctic Startup, and we're a news blog where we write about startup companies in the Nordic and Baltic countries. So uh, if you're interested in what's going on up here, then you have to check us out. Uh, we're also uh, running the Minimum Viable Office, a uh, co-working space in Helsinki. And then additionally, we're building this product called Wire.as, which is going to be like an angelist type product focused uh, on this region initially. So sign up there. But anyways, um, yeah, we're, we're going to have a good chat today about, uh, I guess, your founding story and where you guys are going, I mean, where Gitjar has gone and then uh, what you're up to today. So yeah, I guess to, to, to jump in, what, what is the founding story of Gitjar? Like, how did it all begin? Well, uh, yeah, it's been quite an interesting story because I founded Gitjar in uh, 2006 and back in Lithuania. Yeah. And uh, interesting thing is back then in Lithuania, uh, you know, the whole startup model just was not known at all. So things like venture capital, investments, rounds, uh, just not known at all. So basically, uh, if you find a business, uh, then you either run it profitable or you don't run it at all. So we were struggling, uh, you know, and trying different models and things. And 2006, uh, we put together a, a beta testing site because we were developing mobile games at that, uh, at that time. Uh, uh, there were like hundreds of mobile devices on the market, Java devices, Symbian devices. And uh, when you develop a game, uh, unless you test each game on each device, you have no clue whether it's working or not. Mm -hmm. So apparently just optimizing the game for every device was a big challenge, and we didn't have enough resources to test it everywhere. So we put together a beta testing site, and then just exploded into, uh, say, biggest on the planet, the Java slash Symbian download site on, 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 the, on the planet. OK. So this is how we started. So what, what happened with that success then? Like how how did it all grow up? Like, uh, what's, what's the story there? Because you, you guys raised some pretty big rounds like back in the day. So, like uh, well, yes. Well, uh, again, 2007. Uh, so we are now the biggest uh, download site on the planet. And then uh, one day, you know, uh, one of my colleagues uh, gives me a phone and says, hey, you know, somebody's calling here. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, I'm the only guy in the office to speak decent English. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So, uh, so basically, I pick up the phone, and then there is this guy saying, you know, hey, I'm like, like Rich Wong from Axel Partners, as if it means anything to me. <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure now it does. But at that time, it was apparently pretty. So I say, like, you know, hey, like, you know, how can I help you? You want to download something or you want an app? Or <laughs> <laughs> and he's like a little bit lost and say, well, you know, we're like Axel Partners, like venture capital firm. I was like, venture capital, why are you calling me? <laughs> <laughs> say, well, we're investing. I say, well, you know, go to stock exchange or, you know, <laughs> you know what do I have to do with investments? Yeah. So, yeah, this is a funny story, but since then, apparently, a lot of things changed. Uh, we raised three rounds. Uh, now we work with Excel and Tiger Global. We raised 42 million to date. And, and uh, differently from the past, I didn't realize, you know, what investments is and actually started to do it myself as well. Okay. Now, I heard like back in those uh, early days, you had, um, like, how did you process credit card payments? I heard some story about that. <laughs> so, how, what's the story there? You know, funny enough, right now, you know, uh, I'm investing into a lot of startups in Lithuania. And right now, one of the biggest challenges is still credit card processing. Yeah. Because a Lithuanian startup simply cannot sign an agreement with a bank to process credit cards. I mean, this is impossible by the law. The banks do not open merchant accounts. So if you're a Lithuanian startup, what you have to do is actually launch a company in the US or UK and then process the payments through there. Uh, still, it is a huge, huge challenge and huge, uh, huge problem. Yeah. But back then, basically, the only way, well, apparently, uh, when somebody pays you and we sold advertisings, uh, you know, the only way to sell, uh, as I understood from our bank, was you know, having a physical terminal on your table, like the one that you see typically in shops. Yeah. And then they unlock the feature uh, that with that feature unlocked, you can actually type in, like, punch in credit card numbers. OK. And then uh, my sales procedure would be, you know, if somebody wants advertising on the front page, uh, you know, that, that actually would cost quite expensive at that time, between, like, five and $10,000 per, uh, like, ad. OK. So I would require a fax. And they would send a fax and fax it over. And I would have a pile of faxes. And I was the only person in the startup to authorize to actually punch the numbers because apparently there is a responsibility. Yeah. So, so you know, I take a fox, I punch the numbers. Uh, you know, probability 50% it goes okay, 50% it gets blocked. Yeah. Because it's like you know, believe it or not, Lithuania still is number one per capita hacker, so like credit card fraud country in the world. So there's a lot of red flags going on when you try to process like $10,000 out of Lithuania for a credit card. And then, you know, it's a typical procedure. You get a call from a bank saying, you know, you're trying to like take like $10,000, like, you know, what do you need it for? And well, you have like a template. Yes, it's a legit customer. Yes, this is a signature and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, go over. 
So if I, somebody said to me like you know, 10 years ago, all my, like half of my business day would be literally taking in money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say you're nuts, but that's what it was like uh, that many years ago. And then today you have what, like 300 million users of uh, Guitar? What's the actual number? Yes, the Guitar uh, has grown quite a lot. And uh, a, a year ago, we launched a new product, Guitar Virtual Currency. So yeah. basically, it's a derivative of our business model where we reward the users for downloading. And okay. that community has grown to 300 million users to date and, and still growing, which is apparently pretty big. But, but to me, it's like such a crazy story that you've, <laughs> you've started from not knowing what a VC was. You know what I mean? Like, you know, an Excel partner calls you up. And then, like, you're manually, like, processing these credit cards. <laughs> like, punching and numbers. Yeah, it was yeah, fun. Like, it's, I mean, it's kind of like a story that no one here has an excuse that, like, oh, I'm in Finland. I can't, or in, in anywhere here. Like, I, I, I'm not in Silicon Valley. I can't do a startup. But, like, you're... You did it. Like you, you overcame all that stuff. So it's, it's really interesting that way. You know, uh, uh, sometimes you do things because you don't know that they cannot be done, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I guess this is one of those cases. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Uh, let's talk about like raising money because, like, as you said, you raised like what forty-two million dollars to date. So, um, like, what could you talk about that funding ra fundraising process from first finding out what a VC is to, uh, I mean, like. Growing up the company, moving to California, and so on. Yeah, and uh, I think this is of value to a lot of startups, local startups, because I don't think, uh, even in this crowd, that uh, there is a lot of awareness uh, that what we have in Silicon Valley, what really funding is. To start with, well, apparently, it all started with one call. And then within maybe a month, uh, I received 10 calls from different VCs. So uh, I started to get curious what VC model is at all in general. Yeah. And, and uh, well, I had no clue and no sources. So the only guy who was like super ultra helpful, actually, he might be in this crowd because he was planning to hit the event, was uh, my lawyer, Chris Grew, okay. uh, a UK lawyer, uh, who, as I learned later, uh, earned a record amount of money on me <laughs> okay. because I would hire him for what I think it was like 500 pounds an hour or something like that. Just hang on the phone and explain what preferred shares is and you know, what sure. common shares is. And again, thinking backwards, I realized you know, how patient Excel has to be because typically they close the deal in three weeks. Yeah. Like because of me going so so slowly through the process, I think in our case it took like six months. Mm. So uh, well, apparently when you don't know something, uh, you want you want to move very carefully. I, I mean, I, I wanted to make sure I understand every line of the agreement. So so basically, again, Chris Chris grew, uh, you know, gave me a complete course, you know, like 101 on investments or like you know investments for dummies, yeah. which I was at, at that time. And, and yeah, it was difficult to realize. But uh, you know, the flip side, when I realized. And you know, really learned and, and understood that instruments such as venture capital investment, it's like, wow, you know, it makes like all the sense in the world. It's like so powerful. It can really, I mean, that kind of instrument can really fund you know, new innovative ideas. It's nothing like a bank credit, you know, where you have to give a mortgage and you know, otherwise they don't give you money. And when I realized that, well, apparently I bought the whole heart in that idea. And uh, you know, it accelerates your business dramatically. And you know, once you get comfortable with uh, specific restrictions, you know, once you, you know, just uh, get adopted to the concept that you know, there's a community of, 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 of different parties running the business, uh, then I think it gives you like, a lot of potential resources. Yeah. And uh, you know, to put it into, say, one sentence, if before sitting in Lithuania, I, I, I had never realized you could build like, a next Yahoo in Lithuania, yeah. uh, then I said, wow, you know, actually, we are not living in separate universes. You know, it is possible, and you know, this is the way to get access to a ton of resources and to go scale your company beyond Lithuania and globally. So, so that was a big insight. Okay, like now that we're on the topic of like fundraising, still, like, uh, what what have you been doing, um, like, with your own personal investments now? Because I we were talking backstage, and you you mentioned that you're doing your own investments now. So, what's yeah? Well, I you know I like the VC uh, investments so much, so much that actually this year I started to invest myself. Okay. And, and uh, you know, right now I'm focusing on Lithuania, and uh, I already invested into four teams and invested slightly more than $3 million. And uh, I really believe that there is a ton of potential in our part of the world. But having said that, I believe there is a different investment approach that needs to be taken here. And okay. uh, for example, you know, I'm, I'm looking more into, say, uh, investment slash operating fund because I, I believe there is a value in actually being able to pull together quality teams and plant quality ideas and, and uh, you know, put them in proper structure and essentially you know, not only just give them the awareness and knowledge you know, how they run business, but actually you know, push them a little bit, handhold a little bit more than they typically do in Silicon Valley because this is a common knowledge how you, know, how you build businesses. So I believe in that and, and you know, I'm looking forward to expanding that activity and next year actually planning to, to, to scale that up a little bit. Okay, okay. 
And um, there's been a bunch of new funds like being raised in uh, in, in the Baltic countries, I guess. Right. And right. Um, are you are you going to be like investing on your own personal side or like on? Well, you know, apparently the one uh, the one I think you realize pretty soon investments that co investments uh, actually is a very powerful tool. It's yeah. much better to invest across ten companies uh, with a community of investors as opposed to take one company just yourself. Yeah. Because you know, one key about investments is uh, how do you uh, normalize the risk? That means uh, uh, maximize your portfolio and then make sure that on average it, you know, it has a positive ROI. So that's why you know, I believe a much more powerful model is pooling external money as well. So say uh, uh, combining personal money with external money and then funding teams at early stage and actually creating a solid pipeline for all the funds that you described, uh, I think it's a really high ROI activity in Lithuania. Okay, okay. And um, like... You guys, uh, like somewhat famously, I guess, moved your whole company from, like, developers included, from Lithuania to, to Silicon Valley. Then, yeah. like, what's what's the story behind there? Because it seems like the the Skype story, for example, is like, hey, you can have some coders here, like, in the Baltics, and they're fairly cheap, and then uh, like, you can do all your business somewhere else, for example. So, like, what's why why did you do this? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, again, even though I said that I really believe that there is enough of uh, high-quality people, high-quality ideas, and have enough skill set in Lithuania, it's still it's a very tiny market, yeah. very tiny, very small, uh, uh, and also very immature in many ways. So if I was to summarize, I would say if you are really planning of uh, putting together a, mo a movie like Avatar, you need like a whole Hollywood to support you. Yeah. Because I think the great product is not only a product of its own team, but yeah. it's a product of environment. You need investors, you need employees, you need uh, uh, people, you need experience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the one thing which is difficult in Lithuania is really scaling your company. Like a practical example, we were trying to build a quality assurance uh, QA team uh, in Lithuania, and we were looking for a QA uh, manager. Yeah. And uh, we hired three recruitment agencies, and they realized in the whole country there's only five guys that are capable or qualified, uh, say, to do this, this kind of uh, assignment. And then uh, none of the five at that time was available, period. Like, it took us six months to realize that. And then we uh, do the same in Silicon Valley. It's two weeks, like, with everything. Because, like, so many uh, different people, uh, you know, experience in different areas. And this is just, like, only one illustration. Like, when you want to hire a specialist, like a guy who did nothing else in his life but scale databases. Yeah. You know, and, and every illustration, when we uh, came across necessity to uh, scale our server base from, you know, few SQL, uh, MySQL servers to 200 servers, we realized there is nobody in Lithuania ever done that because yeah. you know, there is low projects of that kind of scale in Lithuania. So again, you find those people in Silicon Valley. And when you constantly you know, realize that, hey, you know, to put together something uh, of a high quality, you just need to be there. Uh, you know, this was a moment when I realized, you know, wow, you know, we really need to build something in Silicon Valley. OK. And you, you also mentioned it's like cheaper overall, maybe, to keep them <laughs> all in, in California. Like, we were talking about this backstage, and this kind of blew my mind. Like, was, what's, no, it's just like one of my favorite jokes. <laughs> what's, like, what was the logic behind that joke, though? Because no, sometimes I joke, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I'm, actually, sometimes, uh, you know, some journalists, uh, you know, really insult, I think, uh, our part of the world by saying, hey, aren't you like Eastern Europe, like, you know, the place of cheap outsourcement? <laughs> Yeah. Right? No, it is a little bit insulting, in a yeah. way, right? uh, at least for me. <laughs> so, so what I say, you know, guess what, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, my company is actually outsourcing development to Silicon Valley because it's cheaper there. Okay. <laughs> and it's like, you know, come on, I mean, how can that be? And then reality is really, uh, you know, and this is a pretty actually solid statement, not in all aspects, but in very specific verticals, yeah. like specific engineering uh, skill set, specific uh, design uh, uh, skill set, it's cheaper. Uh, in a way that you get a much higher ROI on your investment dollars than you do in at least Lithuania. Because, for example, take, a, uh, take like a vertical as a you know, database specialist. Uh, you know, again, as I mentioned here, it's very difficult to find somebody who has experience in that. Typically, Lithuanians are generalists. They do a little bit of everything. Yeah. So when you come across a very specific skill, like you know, I want to scale database, what typically they do is we take a big uh, manual and you know, read it and basically do it by mistake. So it takes two weeks. Like you hire somebody in Silicon Valley who's done that, you know, for Twitters and uh, Yahoo's and Facebooks, he does it in three days. So yes, his salary, like the absolute salary would be maybe 50% higher, sure. but he will do the task twice a short time. So on the net, you win immediately. And uh, there are layers of that efficiency. There is management, there is uh, professionalism, again, because there are professionals as opposed to generalists, there are mm -hmm. specialists, uh, there is long working hours. Again, one reality is uh, kind of coming from European country. I know it is illegal to ask my guys work more than eight hours a day. It is illegal. Like government <laughs> punishes me 
like yeah. literally. I yeah. mean, they walk in and then they ask, you know, do the investigation. They ask people how long they are working, and you know, if the answer is, well, Ily asked me to work until seven as opposed to six. You know, I get penalized. Mm. So, so when you combine all those things, like you know, the uh, long working hours, uh, you know, high motivation for option scheme, which is unknown in our part of the world, at least Lithuania, uh, uh, specialists, uh, management school experience, and so on. Uh, when you calculate ROI on your dollar, you know, you realize, hey, no, I can do much more for a dollar in Silicon Valley than I can do in Lithuania. Mm -hmm. Again, on very specific verticals. Okay, okay. So what? What could we be doing better than like in uh, the Baltics or in like the region in general? Like like taking like what you've learned from Silicon Valley, like like in the way teams form or from from any vertical at all. Like what what could we be doing better up here? Well, I think again, I think uh, for small countries like Finland is like Lithuania is, it's very important to realize what are the areas of. Uh, world expertise that are much better developed than, uh, relative to even Silicon Valley. And one example would be mobile, mobile games. You know, yeah. uh, uh, actually, we were having an interesting panel discussion on DLD conference a couple years ago. So we took a top chart of uh, both Android and iOS titles and realized, you know, guess what? The top chart is dominated by Eastern Europe and Finland. True. You know, no secret, Finland is now like number one country in the world on mobile games. Yeah. And when you start digging, you realize you know, uh, that uh, uh, in our part of the world, we were developing mobile games as early as 2001 and 2. Like you know, for Angry Birds, it's like 52nd title, and they've done a ton of work for Java, Symbian, and so on. While in the US, mobile gaming started with the iPhone, like 2007 only. Yeah. So by the time they just you know, got a taste of what, uh, of what mobile gaming is, uh, teams in Finland and Lithuania and in Eastern Europe had already like, almost 10 years of experience. So, yeah. and, and therefore, you know, it's not a surprise that you know, the Rovios of the world, the supercells of the world are coming from Finland as opposed to Silicon Valley. I think mobile banking and banking in general is actually an interesting vertical. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Um, it was quite funny. Uh, I was visiting a conference in Miami, and there was a big campaign by one of the US banks saying, hey, no, we're like so advanced. We're taking advantage of smartphones. From now on, you can take a picture of your check and deposit it online with your smartphone. Yeah. I know. What the, uh, like, you know, who needs checks nowadays at all, <laughs> right? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Where's the innovation actually here? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, precisely. So, 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 I think that there are banking, uh, mobile, uh, there are many more verticals where I think we have, like, a ton of advantage relative to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And I think if we build startups and communities and, and uh, really exploit those, uh, I think we have a big chance of dominating those as well. Okay. We have about uh, 30 seconds left, so like, I, I also heard oh. that you wrote a, bo a book recently, so what's the, the story behind that book then? Yeah, so I, I launched a book in Lithuania, I'm happy to say it's beaten multiple records. Uh, it, it's became country's number one bestseller in just three days. Yeah. It, it is called The Business in a New Way, and that's specifically about you know, how to build a startup, you know, what's the philosophy behind the modern uh, business, you know, what Silicon Valley has to offer, and you know, those kind of things. I'm really proud of that. It's a pretty interesting experiment, uh, and it's available for free online. You know. I took a liberty of just, you know, against my publisher to just place it online in Torrents for free because for me it's more educational project. But uh, you know, I hope that it changes a little bit of understanding, you know, what is really a proper business nowadays. Okay. Well, our Lithuanian uh, uh, crowd out here will have to check that out then. Okay. Well, it's been very great talking to you oh, today. Oh, thank you, Greg. Yeah. Take care. Thank you.